Burnett Bulletin famously wrote that it is impossible to know, to understand the passions, uh, the emotions, uh, the real issues that touch the lives of those who participated in history without recourse to the period press. Now, uh, the value, the critical value of period press as a primary source is hardly questioned by historians. And yet it seems fair to say that when we look at the press in Europe in the interwar period, not all of those newspapers uh, and other media uh, are equal in terms of the commitment of their editors, journalists, uh, correspondents to factual reporting, to reporting that was open to evaluation by others. Now, when it comes to its coverage of the common turn, the third international, its plans and its operations across Europe and around the globe, the Times of London was working with a secret weapon starting in 1922. And uh, that weapon had a name and his name was Reginald Urge. Reginald Urge was the Times correspondent in Riga, Latvia from 1922 on, but he was also a, a, a trained linguist, someone who had graduated from the University of London with a degree in Slavonic languages, someone who had lived in Moscow and Riga and had been tutoring in English uh, a number of government officials, including members of the provisional government in 1917 in Moscow, and even some who had been a part of the first uh, Soviet government, as we shall see. You know, his linguistic abilities, and he was fluent in, uh, in Russian and Latvian and, and other languages, enabled him to basically read habitually everything that was being published by the Soviet regime, Comintern and, and uh, Soviet government and so forth. But he also had this wonderful network of contacts, and many of them were former students of his, as we shall see, that he could reach out to, to let's say, connect the dots. Now, he was uniquely gifted and uniquely able to be an insightful analyst and reporter uh, of these Comintern activities in Europe. And I think that he deserves a place of honor in the historiography of the Comintern. And um, I hope that the presentation that, that you're about to see uh, will warrant uh, that thesis. So here's uh, the material that I've prepared. Um, first of all, I wanted to take a quick look at Reginald Urch, his background, uh, where he came from, uh, you know, what he studied and some of his key strengths, uh, both in terms of his formal training, but also the, let's say, his personality traits that enabled him to be the insightful analyst of Comintern operations that he was. Um, we're going to then look at several areas of his reporting in our period, roughly 1932 to 36. First, dealing with his correct high-level interpretation of this dualism in, in Soviet foreign policy, which on one hand you had the official outreach through the foreign commissariat of Litvinov and Maisky in London and others, who always talked about you know, peace and, uh, and uh, securing a peace uh, together in Europe, uh, uh, joining the League of Nations and so forth, and uh, anti-fascist fronts and uniting with the democracies against the perceived threat in uh, Nazi Germany and so forth. But then in parallel with that, you have this other track, exactly in all of those nations they were talking to diplomatically through the common term, right, of uh, promoting insurrection, revolution, infiltration of all kinds of uh, state institutions and trade unions and armed forces, and you name it. And uh, Urch understood that very well, and he was not shy about uh, discussing that. Then we'll look into the details of his commentary and coverage, not, not only in terms of the high level interpretation, but he was someone who understood very well, you know, the different secretariats and the different leaders in, in each of those secretariats, the mass organizations, the funding, uh, the modus operandi, shall we say, in all the different countries. Also his coverage of the seventh Congress of the Comintern, which is critical because, you know, there has been uh, an attribution in the historiography of a major shift the common term and at that Congress in the summer of 35 and Urge understood very well that there was a shift in tactic, but certainly not in the overall thrust and in the old uh, overall Bolshevik agenda, which was not really possible. And then, of course, we'll look at the uh, his coverage of common turn operations in Spain, which, you know, he begins focusing on that in 1934 in October with common turn support for the insurrectionist uh, socialists to which 
the communists uh, joined um, when the Comintern gave its uh, its official okay to join these uh, Alianzas Obreras. We discussed all this in our in the second chapter of our book. But he continues that coverage of what was going on in Spain through to the spring of 1936, which is very interesting to us in light of the uh, the themes in our book. So who was Reginald Urch? I mean, he was born in 1884 in a little tiny village in Somerset. And Mark, when you look at the, the map, Mark is about 10 minute drive from the western coast of England, of Somerset, and about uh, 50 minute drive south from Bristol. Basically an agricultural village to this day with a few, hun few hundred inhabitants, a school, a couple of pubs, and, and that's about it. Um, Somehow in his late teens, he managed to get to London and he uh, attended the University of London, getting a degree in Slavonic studies. And he expanded his studies with some graduate work in both Germany and in Moscow. Uh, the Great War finds Urch and his young family in Riga, Latvia, where he went originally and he started uh, tutoring in English. He always managed to tutor individuals who were very well positioned politically and, and in the society. And he ended up getting a job as a lecturer at the Riga Polytechnic until 1915, when in the context of the Great War, the German forces were reaching the outskirts of the city and uh, Urch and his family fled to Moscow. Where in his book, and I'm gonna talk about his book in a minute, he, he describes that very well. They got to Moscow basically not knowing anybody as refugees fundamentally looking for a way to make a living. And again, he managed to get some great uh, students uh, who wanted to learn English, including uh, a member of what was to be, to be the provisional government in um, 1917. Um, he was arrested by the Cheka for, let's say, uh, he was accused of being a, you know, a promoter of counter-revolutionary ideas and so forth. And that was a fascinating experience. He details that in the book as well. He is visited while in prison by Maxim Litvinov himself, the Commissar of Foreign Relations, someone that he would meet later again. And it gives some really tremendous insight from the inside on the uh, repression, the political repression of the Bolshevik regime. In 1920, he uh, is released from prison and he goes back to London but finds that there are few jobs for him. Maybe uh, there were too many uh, uh, of the returning uh, soldiers that you know took up some of the jobs that he was aspiring to. At any rate, he, he did what he knew best. He went back to Riga and started teaching again. And it was there in 1922 when the Times of London reaches out to him and he becomes a part-time correspondent first and later full-time in 1924. And even though he's based in Riga, when we look at his coverage, he is basically de facto co um, correspondent for Russia as well. And he covers, for example, the Moscow trials, the building of the underground, the, the, the starvation in, across uh, all the republics, the disaster of the White Sea Canal, and with all the tens of thousands of lives sacrificed to that program. And then, of course, the common turn and its global reach. Now, Urch and his coverage become so important and so well known and such a reference point that Izvestia, the official organ of the Soviet Union, actually pub publishes a, an editorial uh, trying to correct the, the Times correspondent in Riga's understanding of the common turn and, and of the Soviet Union. And also Harry Pollitt, the uh, British Communist Party Secretary General, also writes to the Times. Uh, as we will see, his coverage of the common turn also drives uh, a lively debate in the House of Lords. In other words, you know, he was an absolutely critical figure. And his discussion of the common turn is, um, you know, a, a key reference point in this time. I, I just want to share a couple of snapshots from his book. I, I was delighted to be able to get a copy of this first edition book that he published in 1936. We generally shoot Englishmen. That's a quote from a member of the Cheka uh, after his arrest. This covers the period 1915 to 1920. 
And the icing on the cake, as you can see here, is that this book is inscribed by his daughter, Edith Urch, in 1949. And she happens to have been a wonderful uh, human being. After the Second World War, she spent much of her time um, taking care of the poor. And, and uh, she had a, a ministry to uh, young girls with addictions, bringing, the, bringing them into her home in London and, and so forth. So it's a wonderful thing to have had a, a, a copy of this book. But this book it gives us a couple of interesting snapshots of Urch the man and of some of his strengths. This is a, an image of him with his students in Riga in 1915, just before he had to run uh, and as he was escaping the, the German forces. But I want to draw your attention to his explanation of this, um, of this photo, in which he says, uh, the drawing on the blackboard represents the fortress of Peremyshin, which the Russians had just captured. And he says it may be noticed that the bright boy who made the sketch has spelled the name incorrectly. And uh, this is classic urge. He had tremendous attention to detail, extremely rigorous. And he figured, you know, this misspelling just cannot stand. I, I, I need to explain that I understand this is not the correct spelling of that word. Anyway. Another fascinating snapshot of Urch the Man uh, is provided by Peggy Benton in her book, A Baltic Countdown. Now, Peggy Benton was married to a member of British intelligence. Um, whose cover, both in Moscow and in Riga, had been, uh, you know, being some kind of a vice consul with the uh, British consulate and being involved in administrative work related to passports. In reality, he was a member of the intelligence. And uh, Peggy and her husband were hanging out with uh, the Urches in Moscow and in Riga. And this is her account of their time in Moscow visiting uh, uh, Urch in, in their home. She says, when I visited Urch at his dacha, he showed us a wall of his study with newspaper cuttings, bringing his Russian press records up to date. And then she adds, but for the company of Reginald Urch, our evenings would have lacked sparkle. And uh, I love this, this little insight into how he operated. You know, I can, I can imagine his study, you know, full of these newspaper clippings. And he was an avid reader in Russian of all of these uh, uh, journals and all of these publications of the Comintern and of the Soviet government. And he understood it, but he also had, again, his network of contacts, which many of them were his former students. For example, uh, Alexander Manuilov, the Minister of Education in the Provisional Government, has, had been tutored by him, and he spent countless hours having tea and discussing the you know, English grammar and so forth. Uh, but also, when he was in prison during his time uh, arrested by the Cheka, the, uh, the Soviet Commissariat of Education also reached out to him to provide uh, a syllabus for teaching English in the Soviet schools. Uh, as I said, uh, Maxim Litvinov himself, the Commissar of Foreign Relations, visited him in prison and he saw him again later in Riga. I mean, and, and this guy was super well connected and, and uh, he had this network that he could reach out to to help him connect the dots and anything he couldn't figure out in his reading, he was able to talk to the right people about this. First thing that I wanna talk about in his coverage is his very accurate understanding of this dualist uh, foreign policy of the Soviet Union, which on one hand, you had the diplomatic outreach and this uh, agitational propagandistic uh, reference to world peace and the brotherhood of men and anti-fascist fronts and you name it, but in parallel, the common turn present in all of these so-called bourgeois uh, imperialistic countries trying to um, bring them down from the inside and infiltration into all their institutions and so forth. Anyway, the first example here uh, is basically based on Urch's coverage of an article that came out in Pravda in uh, early November 1932, which had detailed fundamentally common turn operations in all the Western European countries and elsewhere. And Urge had written a piece on the 8th of November, basically saying, this is what's really going on. This is what the Soviet Union is really up to. And then Izvestia, the official organ of the country of the Soviet Union had written a piece denying it all. 
basically saying the Times of London, its correspondent in Riga has written this. It's all, uh, it's all untrue. Uh, Stalin is not involved in that. We don't know about the common turn, maybe doing its own thing. It's nothing to do with the British government and so forth. And, and then what followed was uh, Urch's piece, basically making fun of his bestia and saying they're not very well informed and here are the sources and so forth. And what ensued was a debate in the House of Lords on the 14th of December, in which uh, Lord Denbigh made direct reference to Urch's coverage. And, you know, it's a fascinating story of back and forth, which again highlights how significant uh, was uh, Urch's coverage of the commentary. He followed up on this theme of the duplicity of uh, Soviet uh, outreaches in other countries in uh, 1935, in which he talked about Stalin's dual role. And in the context of the breakdown of relations, uh, uh, diplomatic relations between Uruguay and Russia, and we will see that uh, article in a minute. And then what I'm suggesting here is that in the, on the 10th of uh, this, uh, January 1936, in an opinion piece, the Times basically editorialized, I'm suggesting fully owning Urch's analysis of this duplicity uh, of, uh, of the Soviet Union outside of its borders, as we will see. So, I mean, this is the piece from November 14, in which Urch is making fun, essentially, of its vestia, saying, uh, you know, in fierce language, his vestia refers together to the Times, that is, to Urch and his coverage, the Foreign Office, the House of Lords, Riga diehards, particularly objects to the references in the survey to Stalin as personally responsible for the common terms activities. And again, he says, you know, they're not, uh, th it, this reflects their ignorance of what other Soviet media and common term media has said. And, and he talks about how the, the Pravda piece itself, after discussing what's going on with the common term in other countries, highlighted and praised Stalin for his role as leader of world revolution. He continues this theme of the duplicity of Soviet uh, foreign relations in 1935 in the context of this uh, interruption in the diplomatic relations between Uruguay and and the Soviet Union, in which the Soviet government, as he says here, refuses to enter into a discussion of the activities of the Comintern on the ground that the Comintern had no connection, whatever, to the Soviet government. Difficult to maintain this, as he says, owning to the openness of Stalin's role and so forth. And then January 10th, 36, in this opinion piece, the, uh, the Times fully owns this analysis from Urch inconsistent dualism, he says, because in addition to the diplomatic outreach, on the other hand, they covertly and subversively undermine the governments uh, and, trans and attempt to transform the order into Bolshevik uh, revolution and so forth. And, and last of all, here's the record of the debate in the House of Lords, in which uh, Lord um, Denbig openly refers to the reporting from the Riga correspondent and puts a question to the British government, you know, are we going to demand an apology from the Soviet government for the recent untrue and insulting charges made in its vestia? And uh, are we uh, stopping the various forms of revolutionary propaganda uh, promoted and financed from Moscow, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it gives you a flavor and a sense of, uh, you know, how significant and how impacting was uh, Reginald Birch's coverage of the common turn in Great Britain in those in those years. Further now into the details of his coverage of the common turn in October 1932, he was talking, for example, about how the common turn in Moscow is subsidizing uh, its foreign uh, operations. Uh, you know, they had a communist party, a section of the communist international in France, in Spain, in Belgium, in Czechoslovakia, and there was direct financing and instruction coming from Moscow. He had, he had a piece also on the revolutionary propaganda in Japan. On, in June 34, Urge, for example, talks about um, subversive propaganda in Polish Ukraine, while at the same time he says Litvinov is in Geneva talking about peace and collective security on that very same day. Then he talks about uh, the common turn plans for trade unions inf infiltrating left-wing socialist trade unions across Europe as a matter of policy. 
the same with youth organizations and so forth. And here's the example from uh, June 10th, uh, in which he talks about the agitation in Polish Ukraine. And first he talks about the impending World Congress, the fact that there are uh, uh, Austrian socialist refugees who had participated in the armed insurrection, that they are in Moscow, that there's meetings involving Manuilski, Bela Kun, so he's very well informed of what's going on. And then he talks at the bottom in a manner that is typical of his articles. You know, you have the main piece and then something akin to footnotes in which he goes into the details of what's going on in Ukraine and so forth. Very well informed, especially in light of the fact that he didn't have access to the uh, Comintern archives, as we do. Uh, but he read literally everything that was coming out of Moscow. And as I mentioned, he had the right network of former students to help him connect the dots. And then uh, instructions from Moscow, he says, both from the common turn and the profit turn on what to do <clears throat> to merge socialist trade unions with the communist trade unions and likewise with youth organizations across Europe. And by the way, that's exactly what happened in Spain. On the seventh Congress itself, and that's critical because of course in the historiography, typically a major shift has been attributed to this Congress for the common turn, not only in terms of tactic, but of fundamental strategy. Assumed that there was a major move away from revolution and insurrection and Bolshevism, putting that on hold to focus on anti-fascist popular fronts and so forth. And, and Reginald Ertz saw through that and he understood very well that there were some new themes, but you know the old themes were maintained and brought forward and continued. And in particular, he pays attention very insightfully to the instructions that were given at the end of the Congress for all the sections to continue their work of infiltration of bourgeois armed forces uh, to promote the breakdown of a chain of command and, and essentially to promote Bolshe Bolshevik revolution in all of those countries in Europe in which, on the other hand, they were promoting alliances and world peace and so forth. And uh, here's his piece written from Riga on July 30th, so five days into the World Congress. He says the chief delegates of the 65 countries at the World Congress, they're talking about preventing imperialist war by class war. In other words, although the official theme was, you know, we are all for peace now, uh, you know, he, he understands fully that the Comintern and the Soviet Union was not against all wars. They were against this all capitalist, all imperialist, all bourgeois alliance against the Soviet Union. But they were certainly in favor of class war and of civil wars that would lead to Bolshevik revolution. And then specifically on so-called army work, writing on August 21st, he writes about the fact that instructions are given to all the sections to promote uh, infiltration in the armies, uh, different uh, cells in, in the army and navy of the imperialist countries to promote the breakdown of the chain of command, to bring Bolshevik class warfare to the army and to basically drive towards uh, a Bolshevik takeover of those uh, uh, capitalist uh, armed forces. He talks about, uh, again, this, this theme of army work. He had been tracking it since at least 1934, as we see here with this piece he wrote about army work, um, common terms supported and directed in the armed forces of Japan. And specifically, his coverage of uh, common term work in Spain is particularly important to me in light of the themes in my book. He begins tracking that in October 1934, as we are about to see, in which the Times, on one hand, has articles under the category of news from, for example, the Madrid correspondent talking about this socialist-led armed insurrection that uh, led to many deaths in Asturias, in Catalonia, and Madrid, and other regions. But then Urge adds the common turn dimension. Okay, here's what the common turn is doing in support of those insurrectionists, and he continues coverage of those who escaping Spanish Republican justice, socialist, communist, anarchists fled after the insurrection, were hosted in Moscow, and then in March 1936 are sent back with the order to continue 
driving their uh, insurrectional activities with support from Moscow. And this is his piece from October 18th, in which he talks about the concrete assistance to be continued. The executive Com committee of the in Comintern and the Young Communist International have decided to continue rendering the Spanish rebels concrete assistance against the La Rue, the Republican government of Spain. They have appointed four agents, including Marcel Cachan from the French Communist Party, and they are encouraging them to sink their differences with the socialists, just make sure that the, the socialists keep the revolutionary fires burning in Spain and so forth. Very insightfully, given his lack of access to the archives, and I direct you for uh, the details to my the second chapter of my book on this, but uh, tremendously insightful here, Urch. And he continues the coverage of that on the 2nd of December with a discussion of MOPR. The MOPR is basically the Russian acronym for the International Red Aid Organization based in Moscow under the leadership of Elena Stasova. In Spain, it was known as Socorro Rojo. In the German-speaking world, Rota Hilfe, International Red Aid. And he talks about how they're raising funds to further support these uh, insurrectionists. He says, quote, voluntarily, the uh, unquote, uh, different workers in Soviet factories are surrendering a percentage of their salary to support these activities. And typical of Urch, you have in his article here, something akin to a footnote in which he goes into the details of the tasks of the MOPR organization, what it does, its vision, and so forth. Very scholarly in the way that he treats these topics with tremendous knowledge and uh, very well documented. And then this is retrospectively writing in 1938, well into the Spanish Civil War. But looking back, he says, Spaniards were brought to Moscow in great numbers, trained in the art of civil war, then sent back as leaders to put their training to practice with the aid of non-communists, quote, socialists, end quote. And their intentions to carry out the program of the Comintern were described in Soviet uh, documents and, uh, and media. And then he talks again retrospectively about the Seventh Congress, which he says here correctly, merely meant new methods for fighting the same fight all over the world. So, you know, it is not surprising, given his the accuracy and the, the depth of his reporting, that when Urge passed away, uh, you know, in 1945, uh, the Times finally put a name to the Riga correspondent, and he, you know, they ran this uh, this summary of what his life had been. And it says, for example, here in 1922, Urge took up work in Riga for the Times as a correspondent. The work grew, and in 26, already as a full-time correspondent, he resigned his editorship of the Lat Latvian Journal. His work as correspondent of the Times was outstanding. It was marked throughout by conscientiousness, real knowledge, and a high sense of responsibility. It adds here, Urge lived for the times. One of his colleagues from Stockholm, where he was when he passed away, wrote his sound judgment, his skill, when availing himself of the opportunities that Stockholm gave him as an observation post during the war years was outstanding. It seems clear in light of everything we've said, especially when we compare with the insight that we have from the archives in our day, that uh, Reginald Urge was uniquely positioned to have a very deep and correct understanding of the plans uh, and, the, and especially the, uh, the execution of the common turn plans across Europe and across uh, the rest of the world. And I would say in light of his coverage that we have seen, the proof is in the pudding. Thank you very much. I hope that has been interesting.